do so. Um, no problem. Wait, so I am, so you can see me. You cannot you see can't... you. No, oh, you, you cannot can't see, see you, but right. we can hear you. We can hear you just fine. We just can't see you. Got it. But um, do you want to choose your own intro music too? Um, whatever, whatever you want works. Well, that's, you know, because then I'll give you something like Tiny Tim or something. Tiny Tim works. How about Adam Lambert? I don't know who that is. Oh, okay. In that case, I'll play it. <laughs> <laughs> you're not, you're not a big, um, a big, uh, American Idol fan. No, you know, I tried to watch it once, like, I don't know, like six or seven season or something. And, um, it was the early stuff when people are auditioning and I couldn't, I couldn't take it because like people's dreams are getting crushed and they're making fun of them. And it's just like, fuck off. Like you're dangling this carrot and you know, God bless them for trying. And you know, there's the people who purposely go on who know that they're not, you know, any good and they just want the, they want the five seconds of screen time. I get it. But there's other people that are pretty good. They're just not good enough yet or whatever. But like, who are they to fight? Especially like when Paula Abdul is judging somebody's singing ability. Like, really? <laughs> um, I, so yeah, I gave up after, after one night. Fair enough. All right. So since, I mean, since I, I know the stuff you like, we'll give you an intro of a uh, rat round and round to start. So, you know, what's really funny. Can you see this? Oh, that's it. I've heard, I've heard that the, the Stephen Piercy book is awesome. Have you um, started yeah, it yet? I'm almost done with it and it's, it's great. And so that's, that's funny that you picked that. Is it the same guy that did, um, it's the same guy that did the Motley Crue book, right? Uh, I don't think so. I thought the Motley Crue one was, um, Neil, uh, uh, I thought that was the same guy who did, uh, the Jenna Jameson book and Marilyn Manson. Yeah. yeah. It's not, it's not the same guy. Oh, all right. Well, I'm sure it's still decent. All right. Well, let's play some round and round. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So we're ready to start. This is a quick um, kind of last minute bonus uh, outside the cinema thing. Earlier this week, we uh, let you guys in on the uh, the big Adam Green one fun fundraiser that is going to be happening the end of this month in, in and around the Boston and Worcester area. Um, Adam's kind enough to take some time out of his what is an ultra busy schedule. Um, and I'm sure he can attest to that to just kind of talk to us for a little while now. Give us kind of the rundown on everything that's going to be happening later this month and, uh, you know, shoot the shit for, you know, a few minutes. Cause we love talking movies with Adam and he's obviously been on the show a bunch of times. So you guys know what he's all about. Um, Adam, what's going on, bro? Uh, a lot. Um, I got, uh, season two of Holliston starting in about 19 days. I got hatchet three in theaters in about 28 days. And then, um, because I had nothing else to do, I put together this uh, three-day fundraiser in Boston. So uh, it's 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 absolutely crazy, but um, but it's awesome. And the Boston fundraiser has really been the most enjoyable part of all of it. It's 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 hard, um, but I do have great people helping me. And um, you know, it's when you work so hard at something that's for such a good cause, uh, you can't work hard enough. Like it's just it's really really been a good time putting this together yeah and it kind of came it came together really quickly um i don't know you probably don't know the when when the bombings in boston happened we were actually broadcasting at the time it happened because we do our show normally on monday so we were in our pre-show when all this stuff is going on and we were trying to figure out what was happening and um so we broadcast our show like normal and tried to like you know kind of ignore the real world as much as possible. As, as you know, things kind of came out, one of the, you know, the things is that so many people were injured and the, the city, you know, the governor and the mayor got together. They created the Boston One Fund, which is onefundboston.org. Um, and the response to the, to the charity has been unreal. But um, this, is, this, is a special, this is a special event. This is a three-day event that's taking place. The proceeds are all going to, to One Fund. And you have some really, really special stuff planned for this. Yeah, um, you know, it's I'm from there, and so it really hit home in a number of ways. And I, you know, I was saying before, I've been so busy with all of these projects happening at the same time, and I never have any time off whatsoever. And my wife had convinced me to just take one day for my birthday and go to Disneyland, which I ended up canceling and canceling, and then ended up being a few weeks after my birthday, but. 
we went there and she's like, just don't look at your phone just for one day. Let's just have fun. But of course I would say, Oh, I got to go to the bathroom and then go check my email or whatever. And I saw what had happened. And so we were maybe at Disneyland for 10 minutes. And then I was like, I, I have to go back to the hotel room and, and watch TV. Cause I, I just like everybody was devastated and it was so hard waiting for news. And um, you know, between texting and email and calling, I was able to connect with everybody that I personally uh, know back there. And thankfully, everybody was OK. But um, instantly I was like, all right, what can I do? And, you know, I've been in this position many times before, like, you know, 9-11. It's like, all right, what can I do? But at that point, that was 2001. Like I hadn't I didn't have any type of celebrity status, for lack of a better term, where I could do anything other than just donate. Um, and so instantly I bought like the Boston strong candles and the t-shirts and, you know, made financial donations for the one fund. But, um, I was talking to, uh, Gene, Gina Megliozzi from rock and shock. And I was like, look, we were going to come there anyway to do a screening of Holliston in Holliston. So what if we turn that into a fundraiser? And then I was like, but wait, hatchet three is going to open. So maybe I can use that to benefit the victims as well. And then it just quickly kind of steamrolled into this three day event, which, I mean, we literally started working on it a few hours after the, the bombing happened. So it did come together pretty quickly. And what I'm, I mean, the two things I'm most impressed with one are the, the fans and, uh, the response to how many people are planning on coming, how many people have already bought tickets, how many people are bidding on some of the auction items that we're making available online. Um, cause there's, there's going to be an auction at the palladium. It's like a big party. There's going to be celebrities there and we're going to be giving away lots of prizes and gift certificates that were donated, but we're also going to be auctioning certain things. But some of the stuff that people are giving is so great. I mean, like Rob Zombie and John five gave an autographed guitar. I mean, instantly, um, John Carpenter, sent me signed DVDs. Eli Roth is sending all kinds of stuff, including an autographed baseball bat from um, Inglorious Bastards. And uh, Odorous from Guar is giving his actual mask that he wore on tour for three years and that he wore for season one of Holliston. Um, these are huge things that, that fans can now own. And so that's been, that's been huge. It's the fan response. But then just the fact that, like, the moment I put the word out there, and I didn't even have details yet. It was just, I'm putting something together to help. And I didn't email anybody. I didn't, like, I wanted to wait until I had a press release and details before I started hitting up all the celebrities I'm friends with to help. But I had just said on Twitter, like, hey, I'm putting something together. And then they all started contacting me. So um, it's just, in any tragedy, the one positive thing is watching what people are made of and how generous and giving and caring they can be and how all egos and everything, it just goes out the door. There was none of this shit from like, you know, bigger name celebrities. Like, well, why am I going to give to Adam Green's thing when I'm a bigger celebrity? Like none of that. Everybody was just like, how do I help? And, and it's it, like, I can't even go through all the emails of stuff that people want to send. And, uh, it's like, it's like a full-time job and there's at least like three of us that are working on it nonstop, trying to organize this stuff and tell people where to send things. And, um, it's really, really been amazing. Yeah. The, I mean, the whole thing is just, I mean, we'll get into some of the more the specifics on the events in just a minute, but I mean, the amount of stuff you were able to pull together in such a short time is, I mean, it's sta it's, it's literally staggering and the, the auction events, or the auction items that are available now, like like Odorous's mask and stuff, these are one of the kind items. These aren't like you're gonna go to you know, uh, Horror Hound and there's gonna be a table selling twenty of these. These are one of a kind items, which makes them even yeah. more special. Yeah, it's it, it, it and like and the fact that that's what they thought that to give um, is is huge. Um, and you know, I I knew that um, Eli and Rob would would definitely be giving stuff just because they're they're from that area um but i i didn't expect everybody else to just start putting stuff in like, yeah, just great right so all right so let's take a look here at the the actual events they are taking place in and around the boston area on may 28th the 29th and 30th the first night is the halston comes home event uh why don't we give everyone a kind of an idea what that is because this is actually this is really cool 
Yeah. Um, last year when we were, we always like tour to promote whatever the project is. Like, I don't really, I don't do many conventions. I just, I just don't have time. Like, thankfully I'm always in production on something and I'm very grateful for that. Um, but when promotion time comes, usually in uh, the couple months leading up to that, any conventions that happen to be happening at that time, um, we'll try to hit. And so one of the things that we did last year was that Emerson College contacted us and asked if we would come and screen the show and talk to the students. And so I was like, fuck, we're gonna be like 45 minutes from the actual town of Holliston, which I grew up there, but I hadn't been there in well over a decade because my family has all since moved away and there was just no reason to ever go back there. Um, but obviously it's still very close to my heart. I set the show there, I named the show Holliston. And so we went there to do a screening and there was only about a week's notice and no big fanfare or anything. It just was like on Twitter and Facebook and some of the newspapers did stories about it because it was an interest story because the show is called Holliston. And as the day was progressing, like we did the screening at the town hall because the only place to really do a screening in Holliston would be the high school auditorium. But that was the night of their senior class uh, variety show called the Senior Showcase, so that wasn't gonna work. So we did the town hall, and they're like, look, there's some folding chairs here, but you're gonna have to bring in a projector and sound equipment and everything, and I was like, no problem, we'll do it. And so it was just the four main cast members, myself, Joe, Corey, and Laura, and one of our producers, Sarah, and it was like putting on a show in your grandmother's barn, <laughs> for lack of a better term, because like we set up the chairs, we set up the equipment, we, we put up the screen, and as the day was progressing, I was like really nervous. And I mean, I've done this a million times now. I've had premieres, at, you know, in the, the, the Empire Theater in London, which is the biggest screen in the UK and Germany and Spain and um, Hollywood. And I've never been nervous because I guess in a way you're sort of playing a character at that stuff. I'm um, Adam Green, the filmmaker at those things. But when you're going home, you're still the kid who grew up on Francine Drive. Like you're, you know, you're not, you're just you. Yeah, people and, know you there. It's not like you're, you know, you're just Adam. Yeah, and because all my, you know, I graduated high school in 93, like all my friends have left. Like I don't know anybody there anymore. So as the day was progressing, I was getting very nervous that A, there would be nobody there or it would be like five people and then that nobody would care. and. We were doing an interview with the Boston Globe backstage and then like the doors opened and I could hear that it was getting full, but I still couldn't see. And then Sarah, who's out there by herself because the cast is doing the interview, keeps running in and she's like, we need more chairs. We need more chairs. And she's like sweating. And then Joe was like, um, sorry, I got to leave the interview. I, I have to go help her. And then I saw him come in and he's pouring sweat. And I'm just like, this is crazy. I mean, the whole town showed up for this thing. You look outside and the Washington Street outside of the town hall, there were cars like as far as you could see, it was like Christmas Eve. That was the only thing I could compare it to. And so when I introduced the show, I was saying it was weird to come home because this isn't home anymore. But then you look out and you see that outpouring of support and you realize that it is home and it'll always be home, even though I'm not physically there anymore. And it was very, very emotional and for, for the whole cast, even though they didn't grow up there. And one of the thing that I'm never going to forget about that night, and it was like standing ovations, people, I mean, they were so excited about this show and they loved it so much. But afterwards we said, okay, we're going to go to Casey's Crossing, which is the bar that we hang out in on the show. It's now called Casey's Public House, side note. But um, we said... We have to clean up all this stuff. We have to put away the chairs and take down the screen. But everybody just go there and we'll be there as soon as we can. And we'll take pictures and sign autographs and stuff there. And then all of a sudden, um, the town just literally stood up and formed a line and started passing each other the chairs. And they they cleaned it up. They swept the floors. <laughs> they, I mean, it was like a Norman Rockwell painting come to life. And um, so we've been really excited to go back there. But the way things turned out, it just wasn't in the cards that we were going to go back this year because I think the network felt like, well, you did that last year. We have such a limited amount of money wow. to spend on marketing the show. We just 
we don't they, they know about it now we don't need to do that and we were really disappointed so when this happened it just all made sense of course we have to go back there of course we need to do this and the network totally stepped up they approved us showing the episodes and we're showing episodes that i mean none of the none of the season will have aired at the time of this but we're showing episode uh five episode seven episode three we're showing stuff that's like deep into the season and um they paid for our flights they paid for our hotel rooms so it was really great so to actually if you're a fan of the show especially to go and see the show in the actual town and it's not just going to be joe and laura and i there corey can't make it because she's having a baby in a few weeks um but derek mears is also going to be there now because as people know he's a frequent guest star on the show and one of the episodes we're showing he's in so he's going to be there as well. So we're going to show three episodes. We're going to do a Q&A, which is sure to be a, a really great time. And it's only $5 to come. It's a $5 minimum donation. So hopefully people give a little bit more. But um, there's plenty of seats. The auditorium's huge. It will not sell out. There's, so there's no reason to think, oh, it's too late. So definitely come to that. And then afterwards, we're all going to go to Casey's Crossing and have some drinks and uh, have a good time. And then Wednesday night is the the party slash auction at the Worcester Palladium. And that's going to include an auction and door prizes and gift certificates and all kind of stuff that people are donating that we're going to give away. And I'll be there with the cast of Holliston. Derek will be there. Kane Hodder will be there. Zach Galligan will be there because obviously both of those guys are in Hatchet 3. Kane's also in Holliston this season as well. Um, and even Mick Garris, who people would know from all the Stephen King movies he's directed and Masters of Horror, when he heard about it, it wasn't just, okay, I'm going to send some stuff. He was like, I'm coming. So he's flying himself there and putting himself up to be there, um, which was just amazing. amazing. Um, and there's all kinds of other people that are asking if they can come as well. But the challenge with something like this is as much as I know the fans would appreciate it, I mean, literally, I could probably stack the place with like 200 celebrities from like Hollywood's A-list to, you know, the whatever you want to call the like sort of horror. The Joe like, Lynch's of the world. Um, but the idea is to keep the cost of putting this on as low as possible. Like all of these things are being donated. The, the auditorium is free. We're only paying for the projectionist time. The theater that we're doing the Hatchet Marathon in is free. The Palladium is free. So um, it worked out that because Halston and Hatchet were both coming out, we were able to write a lot of this stuff off as promotion for the events, even though it's a charity event. So that way, the money that we raise, we don't need to take money out of that to pay for these flights and hotels and stuff like that. So, so it's been hard because there's a lot of people asking if they can come, but if they're not offering to pay their own way, which you can't expect them to do that. It's a lot of money just to be there. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't want to take money out of what we're raising. So there's a ton of people that are going to be there and everybody else is going to be there in spirit and they're all sending stuff. So, so it's going to, that's going to be really special. I'm also auctioning myself off for a date, um, <laughs> which I, last I heard it's already up to like $400, which is great. Um, I did that once before. Uh, Joe and I did a fundraiser in Austin, Texas for the Veterans Hall. It's a place where war veterans live now, and some of these guys can't walk, and they don't have legs, and yet it's a three-story building, and they don't have a working elevator because nobody fucking cares. And so we did a screening at the Draft House where we showed a preview of Holliston, and we showed Chillerama before it came out, and we, we did a... We did a bunch of really just funny stuff there and I auctioned myself off for a date and there's a whole story that goes with that that's really touching but um, but that one went for like $400 so we ended up helping them put an elevator in so um, it's when you can when you can put this to good use um, I don't like I, I can't explain it I like what that feels like because that's that's really when you feel like you've accomplished something with this because the fucking, the money, the fame, the whatever the fuck you want to call it, like it sounds so cliche, but it gets old really fast. And it, and in some ways it's, it's almost a burden sometimes and it, you don't want it anymore. Like you wish you could just be normal or for lack of a better term and go out with your wife and not have somebody coming up to you to, you know, ask for stuff or whatever. Um, but when you can use it for something like this, uh, you really, really 
uh, love it. And, and you don't do it for any other reason, but because you want to do it and you want to help. And it's, that's been amazing. Um, before I get to the story of the date in Texas, um, <laughs> The, uh, the final night is a marathon screening of, of Hatchet 1 through 3. It'll be the first time that that's ever happened. It'll be the first time that anybody in the world can see Hatchet 3. And what's really special about it is that I'm showing a print, a 35 millimeter print of Hatchet 1 from my own personal collection that was from the UK. Now, everywhere else in the world, nobody had a problem with the content of Hatchet. Like, it did not get censored anywhere. It just got the equivalent to an R rating, which is what it should have had in America. But I don't want to even get into <laughs> all of that. But You can go back and listen to our multiple uh, interviews with you talking about the issues with ratings and involving the Hatchet series. Because I think we've got yeah, two or three now. It, it's Yeah, it's it's old. I mean, Hatchet 3, it's the same thing. NC-17, we're going back and forth, making an R version. But the good news is that R version will only be in select outlets that can't carry unrated. So like Redbox and cable TV. But the Hatchet 3 that's going to be playing in theaters, that's going to be on on demand, that's going to be on DVD and Blu-ray, will be the real version of the movie that we made. So... Um, Without getting into all that, I'm going to be showing a, a 35 millimeter print of Hatchet One that's only been played in America once before, oddly enough, at a different fundraiser I did in LA a few years ago. We're going to be showing the a Hatchet Two print on 35 millimeter, which was released in America unrated, which we all know how that turned out. Um, but nobody can stop us this time. <laughs> and then Hatchet 3 will play afterwards. And I'll be there. Kane will be there. Zach, Derek, and possibly some other people. Is um, BJ going to be there, the director? No, BJ will not be there. Um, BJ's working on another movie right now as a camera operator. And again, it's like we were trying to keep it to people that were like a big draw and like nothing against BJ. But like this isn't a premiere of the movie per right. se. So um, we're trying to trying to make it. We're trying to spend the money that we do have to spend on people that are a, a draw. Where like Kane Hodder, obviously, there's a lot of fans that are going to come because yeah. they want to meet him. Until Hatchet Three comes out, people haven't really met BJ yet. Right. So um, not to talk down so yeah. BJ, but he's done. I mean, you go on his IMDb and you look at some of the camera operator work he's done. BJ's uh, BJ's he's legit. Yeah, to totally legit, which is why why I chose him. Um, and I think people are going to be really happy with Hatchet 3. And for anybody who's concerned about Hatchet 3 being like, oh, well, fuck if Green's not directing it, um, the best way to put it with, without, like, uh, taking anything away from BJ is, like, I'm, I'm still in control. I'm, like, this isn't like Nightmare on Elm Street or Halloween or Friday the 13th where the original creator stepped away and just said, you know what, you guys do what you're going to do. Um, I wrote it. I cast it. It's my crew that does all of my movies that did this movie. I was there every step of the way. I had final cut over the movie. So it was kind of like being like the ultimate puppet master in a way where anything that you're going to see. I mean, sure, there were certain things maybe I would have liked a little bit different, but, um, you know, it, you got to make compromises there. But uh, I'm very happy with the movie. I think the fans are going to be very happy with the movie and it is not going to feel like I went anywhere. So, um, so people do not need to worry about that. And BJ um, was a camera operator on the first two films. So it's not like he was new to the franchise. No, that was why we chose him. Like we wanted to, we wanted to promote from within. We wanted somebody who was part of the legacy and part of the family because that way the crew and the cast would be excited and you could get over those first three days of having to challenge this new director and feel him out and blah, blah, blah. Um, and because BJ had never directed anything before, um, everybody was excited to help him. So um, I think that really worked out in his favor as well because a lot of people really carried him through this. So the movie's really good, and I think people are really going to like it. It's It certainly is the biggest of the three, like uh, – just in terms of spectacle and scope, like it looks huge compared to the other two. And that was a choice because this is sort of the, the climax of all of it. And this is where it gets tricky because I'm not supposed to be saying this is the conclusion, but it is the conclusion of my story of, right. of Mary Beth and Victor Crowley. Now that doesn't mean that there couldn't necessarily be a hatchet for or whatever, but I don't know what that movie is at this point. Right. I always had a vision for these three movies and for this story, for how it was going to go. And I think that's why for the fans it's worked. It's not just 
making the same movie over again or trying to force some new angle into it like they did with the other ones. These three movies, when you see them together or when you cut them together, it's one big movie and it all makes sense. So, um, yeah, so that's really uh, my, my, my spiel on, on Hatchet 3. <laughs> But but that's uh, it's twenty five dollars for a ticket to that. Now that one will sell out because it's not it's not a huge theater. It's a theater that only holds like two hundred and twenty five people. But we wanted to do it at a nice theater that has like luxury seating and couches. And um, the the Revere uh, Hotel in Boston has this new theater called Theater One, and it's a really really nice place. But if you're going to sit there for a six hour marathon, you got to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. And with it being summer movie series season it wasn't easy to get a mainstream theater to give up a screen for this because they want the money because iron man is out and star trek right. is out i get it i'm not i'm not dissing them for that but that's why we chose the theater we chose so it's only 25 dollars minimum donation again you can give more please give more if you can but 25 dollars minimum you get three movies one of which has never played in Amer in Boston, especially, or it's only played in America once in the form it's going to play on, and one of which is a world premiere, and there's going to be the cast, some cast, and, and myself there to present it. So very, very special night. And um, we're also going to do a signing at Newberry Comics earlier that day. We're going to be giving away posters. I'm still waiting to hear which Newberry Comics that's going to happen at, um, but that's going to happen. And even the Holliston screening on Tuesday, there's a, a storefront that we show a lot on the show. It's uh, Fisk's General Store. It's been there for over 100 years in Holliston. It's just the general store, family-owned and operated. Um, we're going to do an in-store signing there from 4 until 6 uh, before the Holliston screening on Tuesday where we're going to be giving away free posters of Season 2 and signing those for people. So, um, And around all that is going to be massive amounts of press, radio, TV. Mm. Like We're going to be just killing ourselves, working our asses off the whole time we're back there. But we can't wait to do it. And um, I keep telling the publicists because they're like, is this too much? Like, you don't even have a space to eat or sleep in these three days. And I'm like, more, more. Give us more. Like, whatever we Max can do. Max it out. Max it out. So um, we're we're ready and, and we're, we're excited. Awesome. So I am going to announce now. We haven't actually announced this yet. And actually, I, don't, I haven't even told you this. I meant to tell you before we went on the air. But what I did and what Outside the Cinema did was we purchased a pair of tickets for the Hatchet screening as a donation and we want to give those away to one of our listeners as, oh, you know, as a prize. So is there maybe a hatchet trivia question or something that you can come up with off the top of your head that we could have people answer and that way, give the tickets away that way. I've got something in my head, but I don't know whether it would work all that well. And obviously you made the thing. So, well, um, you know, I guess sort of off the top of my head, here's a good one. Um, obviously with hatchet two, there was a lot of controversy in the fact that, Dark Sky was able to get AMC, a national huge theater chain, to play the movie unrated as part of a new program called AMC Independent. And of course, as soon as that happened, the MPAA wasn't very happy about that. And really, when you think about it, if that had worked, and if the fans had just all over the country, even if they couldn't see the movie, had bought a ticket online, for like whatever the cheapest ticket they could find, like a $7 matinee and supported that, it would have changed everything. Because from that point forward, nobody would have cared about a rating anymore. You wouldn't have needed it. And the MPAA in a matter of short, in a short amount of time would have been gone. And they knew that. So of course the pressure was on. And now all of this stuff, there's no way to prove any of it. They will not go on record saying that they had anything to do with the movie being pulled. Whenever any major outlet has contacted them for a comment, all they do is give the blanket statement of the MPAA is an organization to help parents understand. Like, they right. won't comment. AMC wouldn't comment. In fact, their only public statement was that the movie wasn't financially performing well enough. Well, it's bullshit because, A, it was performing well enough. And they don't even know. No one's going to know what the movie made because they started pulling it instantly. So how do you figure out a per screen average when it only played once on yeah. some of the 68 screens? At, like, noon on a Friday. Too. It wasn't even like they didn't even get most of the theaters didn't even get to their primetime screenings. It was like like the first show of the day. Like I saw it on the first show of the day in Peabody, Mass. And, you know, yeah. it was a it was an 1130 show for a slasher movie on a Friday morning. You're not going to max the theater out. And it was no. pulled by 5 p.m. Yeah. Yet they figure out the per screen average by saying it was on this many screens for three days. And it what like so 
And, and even then they said it did a thousand per screen. For an independent movie with no marketing, that's not bad. Um, that same weekend, a horror movie called Chain Letter, which was rated R, opened on a ton of screens with a ton of marketing and it only made $300 per screen, yet AMC kept it for two weeks. Um, their response was, that was our deal with that distributor and we didn't have a deal with Dark Sky that said we had to keep it. So, so we made history twice that weekend by being the first movie to buck the system successfully and get an unrated slasher movie into theaters. And then we made history again 48 hours later when we were the first movie to ever be pulled in its opening weekend. Um, and again, I don't even want to get into all that again because it was horrible, but um, the difference between the R-rated version of Hatchet 2, which is shown on cable and certain outlets, and the unrated version that people can buy on DVD and Blu-ray is enormous. I mean, they literally castrated that movie. They took everything out of it. Now, a lot of times what they did is they made a death scene that was ridiculous and funny, actually disturbing and realistic because they cut out the over-the-topness of it. So I, I'm never going to figure them out. But one death in particular, this is getting to the trivia question now. <laughs> um, Chad, uh, who's played by Dave Foy, he's the guy in the uh, camouflage stuff with the orange hat. Victor Crowley kills him by using the blunt side of the hatchet. He puts him on the ground, he pins him down, and he beats his face inside out with the blunt side of the hatchet how many times now in the in the rated version of the movie he only hits him in the face three times with the hatchet in the unrated version how many times did victor crowley hit chad in the face with his hatchet so if you know the answer to that and i'm sure if you don't know you can find out uh email us at feedback at outside the cinema.com and let us know that you have the answer for the trivia question and you will be put into the drawing because i'm sure we'll get more than one right answer uh, for the tickets for the May 30th Hatchet Movie Marathon in Boston. The only catch is you need to be able to come to the theater and pick the, pick the tickets up from me, and you need to be able to get there, obviously. Yeah, um, that's something I'd like to point out. Just There's a lot of people around the country who want to help. If you want to help, buy a ticket to the party, to the party at the Palladium, the auction, because that that is impossible to sell out. The Palladium can fit like thousands of people. But don't buy a ticket to Hatchet or, or Holliston if you can't go because those could sell out because there's only so many seats. And that means if everyone does that, we're going to be screening the movie to an empty theater and there's going to be a lot of people that wanted to go waiting outside that, that can't get in. I mean, obviously, right before the movie starts, if there's still empty seats, we'll, we'll sell more tickets. And, but if a ticket is sold, we have to assume that seat is accounted for. So if you can't go... There's other ways to make a donation besides taking up the seats. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, please don't don't do that. Cool. So yeah, if you want, if you you know the answer to how many times the back of the hatchet was used in Hatchet Two in the unrated cut, uh, feedback at outside the cinema dot com will put you into the bucket for win a pair of tickets for the Hatchet Movie Marathon and the first time Hatchet Three is being shown publicly. All right, cool, Adam. Let's yes. also what when you realize the difference between how many times he was hit and how many times he's hit in their version, you'll really understand what I'm talking about in terms of just how much they took out of the movie. That's the only hint I'll give you. Excellent. Now let's get back to you. We're going to tell a story about when you auctioned yourself off as a date in Texas. Let's yeah, get back to that. Cause I want to hear that. Um, so, uh, when hatchet one came out on DVD and Blu-ray, um, actually it was DVD at first, the Blu-ray what didn't follow until a couple of years later. Um, we were, really uh, excited to put some extensive behind the scenes features on that DVD. And it's become harder and harder to do that because the distributors just don't care anymore because most people, they watch this shit on Netflix or, you know, streaming. They don't buy DVDs anymore. And this goes for even big Hollywood movies, DVD and Blu-ray purchases are down almost 40% from what they were five years ago. The fans just don't buy them. So therefore, they don't want to spend the money making this bonus content. And you can only do so much. Like for Chillerama, like that was all stuff that the filmmakers put together ourselves. Um, even like Frozen, like there was only like a thousand bucks for behind the scenes stuff. And Adam Barnick, God bless him, was there to shoot the whole thing. I mean, the, the making of that comes with Frozen is 90 minutes long. It's like a whole nother movie. It's a like it is absolutely the best I've ever seen on an independent movie, second to Grace. 
uh, which Adam Barnick also did. But to have an actual filmmaker come and document the stuff as opposed to just an EPK crew, it's astounding. And with Hatchet One, we told the whole story about where the idea came from when I was eight years old, all the trials and tribulations of getting that movie made, how we did it, the the story of how I forged this weird relationship with Dee Snyder and how he just kept uh, encouraging me to do it. Um, you know, He didn't do anything to actually help the movie get made necessarily, but how he helped me keep going. And that those bonus features really touched a lot of people. And it's one of the most common things we hear about that movie is how much people love the bonus features. And there was a guy who wrote to me through my fan mail um, and his name was John Igley, and he was a former police officer who had been injured and at the time thought he was going to be paralyzed for life, that he was not going to walk again. And the story was really tragic in a lot of ways, but one of the ones that really, really struck me was that he had a partner who was a canine unit, and they were going to take the canine away from him because that you, know, you can't just buy that off of the police force. Those dogs go through a lot of training and they're very expensive and the dog was going to have to be reassigned. And he, I mean, this poor guy's life was in shambles, but he wrote to me to say he kept watching them behind the scenes and just, you know, he wasn't going to give up and he was going to walk again. And, um, he was just, you know, just basically saying thank you for sharing this story and what it meant to him. And of course I wrote back and a couple of years later I heard back from him again and he was moving his legs, which they didn't think was going to happen. And um, he got his dog back. I don't know how he did it, but um, it was just great to hear from him. And so a good seven years later, I guess six years later, whenever this, this event was in Texas, when they announced the winner of the auction, they said, and your date is going to be with, and they say the name, uh, John Igley. And I'm thinking... God, I know that name. And now, like, between Twitter, Facebook, the fan mail, I mean, I can't keep the name straight all the time. I hear from so many people every day. Um, but the name rung a bell. And this guy, who didn't look anything like the guy in the pictures, because it was all police officer pictures, clean shaven or whatever, shows up walking down the aisle. And that's the key thing, walking down the wow. aisle with a full beard and everything. And he looked at me, he's like, do you remember me? And I, instantly I remembered him but the fucking guy's walking now, you know? Insane. And, um, it's amazing. He's walking now and he's, he's, uh, sorry. Oh, wow. Um, he's opening, uh, he just opened a bar. Um, and he, and he did it. And that is just fucking awesome. So as silly as it sounds, when it's like, oh, I'm being auctioned off for a, d a date, a dinner or whatever, uh, with somebody. And, um, it means a, a hell of a lot to the, the people who, who do bid on those things. So, um, I saw earlier this morning, the one in Boston's already up to $400. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I got uh, it right in front of me. I've got a uh, 400. There's been, already been six bids and it's $400. The Gore mask is already at 500. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. And the John, the John five Rob Zombie guitar is at 250 currently. These are all available at, at www.32auctions.com. And then just do a search, uh, and you guys can track them down, but all three are there. Yeah. You're $400, my friend. That's awesome. Um, I hope that doesn't mean I have to put out. Um, well, it depends I mean, on the person that comes up. I appreciate that. But... And it's probably going to be Joe Lynch, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to show up in a dress. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have $400. So don't worry about it. Joe, Joe, I, we, when we met Joe last year, uh, I, I like Joe a lot. I can see why you and him get along so well and why when the two of you work together. It must he's be. just a good guy, and really like at the, from the moment I first met him, like I mean, he's from New York. I'm from Boston. He, we have the same East Coast, oh, East Coast work ethic. Like me, he does not go out. He doesn't go to clubs and all the Hollywood shit. Like we, like I don't do any of that stuff. I'm just, it's just not my scene, and it's not why I got into this. Um, so we're just very much focused on our family, our friends. Like me, his closest friends are still the, the people he grew up with. Um, so we just really clicked right away. We have a very similar sense of humor. And, I mean, the rest is sort of history. But, yeah, he's a great, great guy. Now, it's, that kind of um, steamrolls me into my next thing, which is, you know, I've always been a big supporter of you. And I've always loved you to death, almost to my detriment, according to my friends. But <laughs> <laughs> um, now you're stepping on feet because you've, you've launched a podcast with Joe. Um, and I, I, I might take, take offense to that because that's my thing. <laughs> yeah, you know it's funny. It's like 
when, once, you know, when Geek Nation asked me about that, because I had guessed it on a bunch, the guy was like, you know, it'd be really great if you would do one here. And I was like, you know, we were talking about doing something like that just for Holliston, that we would do a podcast each week as like the movie crypt and talk about the episode. But then we were like, you know, I'm not a podcast guy. Like, I don't really listen to him because I just I just don't have time. But um, Joe was like, well, yeah, let's do it. And so we said we would do it and then instantly found out that friends of ours have podcasts about horror stuff on Geek Nation. So they were not happy about this. <laughs> and then like just, you know, nationwide, all the friends we have to do podcasts were like, seriously? But I mean, <laughs> like there, there's room for everybody. And, and ours is very unique because we're not discussing stuff the same way other people do. We're not like, if there's no news, we're not doing interviews necessarily. I mean, we, we do interviews, but there, it's a very different and unique. Episode two had Daniel Harris on it. You don't do interviews. Well, yeah, but we're <laughs> we're talking together as as fellow filmmakers and sharing our tales from the trenches, as opposed to like a straight up interview. Like this week, we're gonna have Sid Haig on, and like you know, every time he does interviews, it's always about the the horror stuff he's done and like you know the Rob Zombie movies and such. But like, what I want to talk to him about is like, you know, he worked with Lucille Ball. He was on Gunsmoke. He, the, the guy has been working consistently for like fifty fucking years or more. So it's like that's what I want to know about. How do you last that long as an actor, um, and what do you go through? So that it, it's. It, it, it's it's very unique, and of course, we occasionally are going to do a commentary for a movie. The Friday the Thirteenth Two one was was very popular, so I know people want to know if we're going to do all the Friday movies, and we I don't know the answer to that yet because what I never want to do is criticize somebody else's work, and there are some of the Friday the Thirteenth films that were more missed than hit, and I need to kind of refamiliarize myself with it, know that there's enough positive stuff to talk about because I don't want to I don't want it to be mystery science theater where we're trashing something. Right. Because who who are we to do that? But um but yeah, so we'll, we'll see. But we're gonna do a lot of non horror stuff like E. T. and Stand By Me, Battleship, which Joe and I, that's one of our favorite <laughs> movies. Um, and again, anybody who dogs that movie, I guarantee you didn't see it. Because everybody was so hip to be like, fuck this movie because you know it's a video game, it's a uh, it's a board game, and Battleship, and Rihanna's in it. I I don't know how somebody can like those types of summer movies like Independence Day or Transformers and not think that that movie was fucking awesome. So um, and it's it's been my mission, and I've slowly been turning people onto it. Where I'll be like, you know what you need to see is Battleship, and they're like, what are you kidding? And then <laughs> after they watch it, they're always like, you know what? It's pretty I, good. <laughs> I really liked it. I'm like, see. So um, that's definitely in, in the cards. Maybe I'll fit that on my dance card. Um, with Sid, when you guys talk to Sid, you know what gets Sid going is when you talk to him about his work with Jack Hill. Because when we, we met him oh, a couple yeah. times and we you know did the same thing, we were like, I'm like, I don't want it. I mean, in our show's a cult show. We're not real. We're not. I mean, we do a lot of horror, but we're not a horror show. So when we were t approaching him, you know, he right away was like, oh, these guys are going to start talking to me about Rob Zombie and all this bullshit. Not bullshit because, I mean, they're great roles, but we immediately were like, Hey, listen, uh, we want to talk to you about the work you did with Jack Hill, you know, specifically like spider baby and the women in prison films. And this dude, I mean, as much as Sid Hay can light up, I mean, cause yeah. you know, he's, he's, he's an intimidating guy. I was like, Oh shit. Yeah. Let's talk about that. And one thing that we always do is when we try to talk to people, we don't want to, I mean, yeah, obviously, you know, you didn't film this film last year, you did that film, but like, let's talk about where you came from and what you love. Yeah. So that always is, is, a, is, I'm glad you're looking at it that way and not like just, you know, Hey, you know, what's, you know, obviously you want to talk about what people have going on now, but it's not the type of thing where it's like, you're living off of, you know, Oh, well I, you know, I saw mama last week and now we're talking to this person that was in it. And that's cool though. I, I mean, I'm giving you a hard time, but I mean, I'm glad you guys are doing a podcast because I like listening to you and you and Joe together are a riot. So that's right. Thank, thank you. Yeah, it's it's been um it's been a lot of fun, and I mean that's the best way to sort of engage a natural conversation with somebody is, you know, you do press junkets and interviews. I mean, like what I'm doing now between Halston and Hatchet, like it's kind of the same questions, and and but then all of a sudden when someone's like, can we talk about Spiral? It's like what? Re yes, yes. Can we please talk about Spiral? Like, because I never even got to really promote that movie because yeah. it came out too close to Hatchet. It was. It was released four months after Hatchet, so it was buried under the kind of juggernaut that Hatchet became, and a lot of people didn't even know about it or see it. And 
that movie, like that and Frozen are my two best films as far as I'm concerned. And on an artistic level, there is, I could talk about Spiral for fucking weeks. And I, I never really got the chance to do that. So whenever somebody, even at conventions, like, mm. It, obviously fans come through and they have all the hatchet movies and, and hopefully frozen and Halston or, or grace and whatever. But like when someone's got spiral, there's just, there's not a lot of those. So it's like, I always like have to like hug them and then talk about it and stop the line for a second, because I'm just really happy that people are starting to find that movie. It's cause it's nothing like anything else I've done. And, um, but artistically, I think that movie shows a lot more of like what I'm capable of yeah. than the Hatchet movies, which are very specifically the way they are. Like that's what they're supposed to be like. So, yeah. um, and you know, that's people who like Spiral don't like Hatchet, and there's you know people who like Frozen who don't like Hatchet, or there's Hatchet fans who hate everything I do that's not Hatchet. Like I, you know, I, I'm never gonna win with everybody. But yeah. uh, I don't know how least. anyone can hate Frozen. Frozen is just. I mean, oh, believe me, it's they're they're out there. It's, that was uh, my that was my number one film of what was it 2011, or is it 2010? I, look, I mean, it's 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 all it's opinions are opinions and it's all arbitrary. But I mean, I had a woman at Rock and Shock, which who came, who waited in the line to come up to me and literally tell me to go fuck myself and yell at me. And Joe was like snapping pictures of this while it was happening because he couldn't <laughs> believe it because she was just like you know, why would you do this? And, you know, I just want hatchet movies and Victor Crowley wasn't even in this. And this movie was the biggest piece of shit I've ever seen. And I'm just like, whoa. And of course, just, you know, I'm smiling and I'm like engaging her in conversation. And ultimately what it ended up being is that this woman works with Greyhound Dog. She's a, an animal lover like myself. And Parker's story about being scared that her dog is going to starve to death because nobody's going to know that she's dead and nobody no, nobody has a key to her apartment to feed her dog, moved this woman and got her so emotionally upset that she in turn hated the movie. And I've seen this with movies where because people were scared, they shit on it. They hate that you got them. They hate that they were scared. Like, so they say it sucks. Like, well, isn't that what you wanted when you went into it? Um, so like, it, it's, I learned with the, very first movie I ever did to just you got to have a thick skin you can't take it personally even when people make it personal it's it's a movie people some people are gonna like it some people aren't you're gonna get bad reviews you're gonna get like it doesn't fucking mean shit it doesn't matter all that matters are the fans and and doing what you do and and that's that's it hey a reaction's a reaction whether it's good or bad if you elicit a reaction from somebody you did something right but I don't make uh what button pushing, you know, like art house cinema, you know, it's like, you know, a movie like, you know, uh, martyrs or uh, Serbian film or one of those Serbian film or whatever. Like those movies were made purposely to try to elicit a reaction. Like hatchet two is not like a movie where you're like going to get people like debating the merits of, you know, whatever it is. <clears throat> it's <clears throat> sorry. It's, it's it's a slasher movie. It's for fun, and then and, you know that's what it is. So I do think it's funny when, or the fact even that Hatchet Two has become this controversial movie that it it has a place in history now as a very controversial film because of the MPAA thing. Then you watch it and you're just like, huh, really? Like it's not my fault. I didn't. I didn't <laughs> that you know, it's real. I'm one thing. I'm actually pretty pretty glad about with Hatchet Two when the DVD came out. It. I, and I don't know how much control you have over like, you know, the DVD jacket and like, you know, quotes and stuff, but I'm really glad that there wasn't like a big banner on it that was like removed from theaters and like, you know, trying to play up the, like, like the video nasties back in the day would be, you know, like banned in 36 countries and like all that stuff. It really didn't, I don't think it had anything on there about it. No, we, Dark Sky was, you know, they've been fantastic to work with. I, I can't say enough about them because they're a very filmmaker friendly company and, we had a conversation instantly because when the movie got pulled, there were people online saying it was a publicity stunt and that Dark Sky pulled the movie in order to be able to make a big story out of it. But if you notice, once it happened, I did no interviews. They released no comment. None of us said a fucking thing. We let everybody else say it for us because at that point we couldn't win. It was done. Like the movie was assassinated and me trying to keep fighting with the MPAA, I, I can't win. I'm not big enough. So I, it, that was it. Case closed. But we did say, let's please not 
slap a sticker on this that says the movie that you know they pulled from theaters and they did because it's bullshit and like it's a it's bullshit that it happened and we're I'm like we're not proud of it. It's not a good thing. They lost a ton of fucking money over that. Yeah. Like I'm I I was so glad that the mo- that the movie sold as well as the first one did and that a third one got greenlit. But we thought that was the end at that point. Like the, I didn't know how they were going to recover from that type of loss because as much as it's only 68 screens, the prints, the promotion, the the advertisements that they did do, and it was you know nothing compared to a studio movie's budget, but there was money spent. We thought it was over, so you know we didn't do that, and um, we tried not to play it up like you know the controversial movie because it's not a controversial movie. So it's I, you know you don't want to mislead people any more than they already were misled. And there's a lot of people that they only saw that movie because they heard about it on CNN and like big places. Other before the movie getting pulled, they never even would have known what hash it was. So. Wow. Everybody wanted to see this movie that was so controversial that it got pulled from theaters. And I'm sure, I mean, if it was me when it was over, I'd be pissed. I'd be like, what? Did they make this up? This is this doesn't make sense. And that's my point. It didn't make sense. It shouldn't have been NC-17. It shouldn't have been pulled from theaters. And that's why we put it out so everybody could see this is what they're saying is too much for an R rating. And look, everyone knows the flaws of the MPAA. They know that it's a financially driven organization. That's none of that's new news. And I'm so tired of talking about it. I don't even fucking care anymore, but like it's the movie is not a controversial movie. It's a slasher movie and that's it. Period. So, Done. Yeah. Um, what's, uh, what, what, what's the next, what's your next feature that you're going to be get, getting in the chair for? Um, is it the, I know you got the documentary, the digging up the marrow documentary. Yeah, that's, that's really the next feature that I'm, that I'm directing. And, um, you know, we, we called it a documentary when it started because it's presented as a documentary, but again, like I don't, it's one, like I try, I go, I try really hard to not spoil things for the fans because there's, there's a lot of them that I don't know why they do it, but they like ruining things for themselves and they'll look at every clip or review or like just see it you know like well like see look at the poster look at the trailer that we put out and just see the movie like don't like don't spoil it for yourself and this is the type of thing where the less you know about it the more you're going to enjoy it so um but it is it is a narrative feature and um it's it's presented as a documentary and it legitimately did begin as a documentary but then it became something that it's still it's still evolving as we're shooting. So, um, but I've been so busy with Holliston and Hatchet Three, I haven't been able to be spending as much attention on that. So, come uh, June and July and August, I'm going to be on that like really full time, and hopefully it'll be out uh, for everybody to see next year. So, I'm I'm really excited about it though. Again, I keep trying to do very different things. It's nothing like anything else I've done. It's it's very thought provoking. It's very interesting. It's super fucking cool. And the amount of talent that we have working on this thing behind the scenes uh, creatively, it's like this dream team of, of, of people. And I'd be spoiling things if I said it. But, you know, even Hatchet 3, there's three main characters, or not main, there's two main characters and a cameo that nobody knows about yet. I mean, two main characters that we never announced were in the movie because now there's a surprise waiting for you. The movie opens in whatever it is, 28 days from now, 29 days, and people don't even know. And so I just think that that's super fun because now when that happens in the movie, you're going to go, what? Wait, really? And uh, so we go to great lengths of that and hiding it on set and making sure that nobody's tweeting pictures. And I mean, because like Twitter has just ruined filmmaking because you – I, I I haven't had to do it yet, but like certain directors, Chris Nolan, whatever, literally, if you have a cell phone, you have to, they'll like pat you down. Like you have mm-hmm. to put it somewhere at the beginning of the day because you can't risk a picture getting out of what you're doing because instantly it'll be on all these websites and the movie's ruined. So yeah. um, with Hatchet 3, I'm very proud of the crew and everybody involved from the the making of it on set to the post-production crew, who are the real heroes of these things. I say it all the time, but the actual shoot for movies like this, it's only a few weeks. But then there's other people that work for a year after that, every day actually making the movie. And um, they never get the credit. So usually on behind the scenes, it's like, and then we put the movie together and there's like a music montage. And it's because there's nothing to really look at. It's people sitting at computers and monitors. So 
Um, but yeah, everybody kept their mouth closed and word has not gotten out. And when I show the movie in Boston, I'm going to ask the audience to please take an oath and anything they see in Hatchet 3, please just for two weeks, don't talk about it and let it be a surprise for other people. And hopefully, uh, everybody will, will listen to me and, and be cool about it. And it, you know, it's, it's kind of fun to be in on the secret and, and not tell anybody, you know, but there's also that one guy who needs to be the know-it-all who's well, like, it's, it's also, everyone wants to break news. Everyone wants to be the person that breaks the news that, Oh, well, well I saw hatchet three and there was a cameo of so-and-so. Yeah. Everyone wants to be that it's person. It's not like Brad fucking Pitt is going to show up in the movie or something. It's, you know, I don't want to get people all excited. Like, Oh shit. Like Steven Spielberg's in it. Like that. No, that's not it. It's within the hatchet universe and the slasher universe. There's people that are going to show up in the movie that you're going to be very happy to see again. Um, that's, that's all I can really say. Excellent. Now, I want to get your opinion on something that you're not in any way remotely involved with, just because it seems to be really – like it, I, I can't believe the reaction the new Evil Dead flick got and the different opinions. And you being you know, a filmmaker and a lifelong horror fan, uh, I'm assuming you saw the Evil Dead you know, reincarnate, remake, you know, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Uh, what did you think of it and kind of where do you feel it falls in the world of horror today? Uh, you know, I've avoided – this question completely. Um, every interview I get asked this and I have not answered one way or another again, cause I don't like saying anything negative about somebody else's movie, but well, that says it all right there. <laughs> I know, but I guess what I'll say is like evil dead as a, as a sort of precursor, I love evil dead. I grew up with evil dead, just like you did. And like, you know, it, it holds a special place in my heart. But not such a special place where I was like, you know, it's like they were going to remake E.T. I would be like devastated, like what? But Evil Dead, I was like, of course you're going to remake Evil Dead. Like, you know, they've remade everything else. Why not? So it's not like I'm that attached to it. Um, but it's just sort of in broad strokes, like what I did love about it was that Sony, because they do control most of the MPAA, again, see Kirby Dick's documentary. This film has not yet been rated to see what mm -hmm. I'm talking about was able to get a R-rated horror movie that was so fucking gory. I mean, way gorier than any of the Hatchet movies. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, into theaters. And I think that that's awesome. And I think for a young generation of horror fans who are used to going to the, you know, they don't seek out the independent stuff or the more obscure stuff. They just see the mainstream movies. That's what they know of horror. And that movie hopefully just hit a bunch of people like right square in the gut because they're not used to seeing gore like that. And I thought that was awesome. Um, I, there's a lot of cool stuff they did. I loved a lot of the nods they did to the originals having the car and, you know, but it was just missing something for me that was more than just a little something. It was, there was a, a, a soul to it that I, I didn't get. And, it, and the only thing I can compare it to, in a weird way, is kind of like the Friday the 13th remake where, like, I loved Derek's interpretation of Jason. There was stuff about it that was really fun and cool. But um, pick a side. Like, do you want it to be funny and campy or are you making it serious? But pick pick a side. Don't just try to play it safe by being like, well, we'll kind of be silly here. but not Because the audience, I saw Evil Dead with a midnight crowd. They were not laughing at the right places. Um, at all. And it, 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 so it was not really working like I think they wanted it to. But then again, you look at how well it did, you know, can't complain, man. It, it did great. Right. And so I'm excited for them. I'm still a fan of every, everybody involved. I can't wait to see what the director does next. Um, it was a great success for the genre. I loved how gory it was. Um, and that's really sort of all I can say. Excellent. Um, I think we've kind of covered pretty much everything. Um, oh, you know what I want to ask you actually really quickly because I know um, you talked to Eli Roth quite a bit. Is his film, The the Green Inferno, is he still working on that? Because he's, his name is attached to everything. And I know this has got nothing to do with you. And this is like totally like, hey, what's up with Eli Roth? But like, I mean, he just did Hemlock Grove. He's got Aftershock. He had announced he was doing The Green Inferno. He had a sci-fi movie. Do you know anything about what he's got going on as far as his next directorial feature? Um, no, in my limited conversations with him, um, I have not heard what he's doing next. I know Green Inferno is the, his directorial one's going to be out next. Um, my friend, uh, Magda, who people know from Halston, she was in the season finale last year. She was in it. 
And um, her stories, I mean, they were really out there in the jungle in horrible, horrible conditions. And um, I'm really excited to see. I'm just excited to see something else that Eli directed. You know, yeah, exactly. Been- so um, I'm really excited for that. I have not gotten a chance to see Hemlock Grove yet. I, I've just been so busy with my own stuff. Um, but yeah, I don't, I'm not sure. Um, and I mean, we're, we're, we're both very similar in the fact that we do, we don't just direct or write, we both act, we produce. So uh, even you know, just this year, I have Digging Up the Marrow, I have Holliston, I have Killer Pizza, I have Hatchet. I have like, there's so many things I'm involved with. So. Um, I can tell you Killer Pizza, like, I have absolutely no news on that. I don't expect <laughs> it to be made anytime soon. Um, it looked like it was going to be made. We were full steam ahead. It was awesome. And shit fell apart. So um, it, it will it will live again. And, I mean, especially, you know, when you're dealing with people like Chris Columbus and, you know, uh, people of that caliber, like, it's not like an independent movie where it was a small budget movie and, you know, the budget falls through and it goes away, like, It'll happen. Um, it'll happen when when it happens. But um, yeah, but uh, I don't I don't know what else Eli has coming up. But I'm really looking forward to, to Green Inferno. And for me, it's uh, it's digging up the marrow. And um, there's a couple other things that are still too early to even say the name of or announce. But um, there's no I'm not letting up anytime soon. What I can say though is that um, as far as Holliston goes, it's there's a good chance that it might be a while before we do a third season. And I know that's not what people want to hear, but um, we've been very upfront with people from the get go that like all, this entire cast has other stuff and we're not giving up all of that to only do the show. So the show it's worked out for two seasons that everybody was able to be available at the same time. But um, I said earlier in this uh, discussion that Corey English is having a baby in a few weeks, like, for all of us, that is the most important thing right now. And she's all like, you know what, just give me a few weeks and I'm ready to go and we can start rehearsing again. And it's like, she's got to enjoy this time. She's got to be there. And um, so even though like she wants to come back to work right away, like I'm not letting her. So like uh, that baby's life and health and joy comes first for all of us. So there's that. There's the fact that Joe's about to start his next movie, Everly with Selma Hayek, which was just announced last week. And I have digging up the marrow going, and I mean, D, my God, he's got Broadway shows. He's got, I mean, guys, just he is so busy and odorous with with Guar and, and and a new thing that he's working on, a new comic thing that he's got going. So it might be a while before we do a third season. Um, would you guys I, ever do a movie? Would you do a Halston movie? Eventually, we we would like to do that, and the ideas have been thrown around, and um, it's funny. Uh, Every now and then you'll get a director who will contact you and throw their name into the hat being like, hey, look, I know you'll probably be the one to direct the movie, but if you don't, I'd love to direct a movie with you and Joe. And um, one of the guys who's been saying that now for a while is Neil Marshall. And I'm just like, (laughs) that could be a really interesting movie. Um, So, yeah, maybe eventually we will, but um, we're not rushing into a third season. And also the, you know, the, the climate is changing where now you got Netflix and Hulu and Amazon doing original content and everything's being streamlined as far as how fans are watching television. It's not about being home at eight o'clock to watch must see TV. Um, so that's also changing the opportunities and, and the ways to do this. So you know, we've, been, we've been very grateful and, and fortunate that we got to be the flagship show for FearNet, which is a new network that's still growing. But of course with that, it's, Sometimes it's hard because not everybody gets FearNet. And so mm-hmm. you promote the show and you're all excited, but then people are like, well, I don't get the channel, so how do I see it? And then you got to wait until it eventually hits outlets that people can right. see. So the promotion gets very spread out. But the good thing is it is catching on. More and more people are finding it every day, and the show just keeps growing and growing. So we want to do a third season. Um, I just don't know how how and when it will happen, but it, it will happen. Um and oh, one more thing as far as Halston is concerned, if you don't get the FearNet network in your cable lineup and you don't get it in your on-demand lineup, which you should check because just because you don't get the channel is in terms of like, you know, Comedy Central, ESPN, there's FearNet, you might get it in on-demand. So you should definitely yeah. check. Com- um, Comcast up here is like that. Like I have Fios and I have, I have a standard definition version of FearNet to watch plus the on-demand. Like the Comcast up here only has the on-demand. <clears throat> 
yeah, weird. It's, it's different everywhere. In LA, thankfully, we get Fairnet, the channel, and Fairnet HD, which is terrific. So um, it all depends where you live. But one of the things that they're going to do this season is uh, the, the show airs, a new episode airs every Tuesday at 10 o'clock p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. But then on Thursdays, 48 hours later, they're going to post the episode on their website, just fearnet.com. So not ideal to watch to watch what we do in a small box on your laptop, unfortunately, but it's better than not being able to see it at all. And we're very grateful that they're doing that for us. So each episode will remain there for one week until the new episode replaces it. So definitely a way for everybody to see it. And, you know, like we... The crew that we have on this show is astounding. Like Bear McCreary is our composer. And people know Bear from The Walking Dead and Battlestar Galactica and David Goyer's new series, Da Vinci's Demons. He's the top composer in television, period. And yet he does Holliston with us simply because he loves it. Um, Matt Waters is my sound designer who's been with me since Hatchet One and my sound mixer. He just won an Emmy last year for Game of Thrones. So he's probably one of the highest paid sound mixer designers in Hollywood. And he does Holliston because he loves it. So the amount of talent that goes into this, and if you ever see the show on Blu-ray, yeah, it's a sitcom, so it needs to look and sound and feel like a sitcom. But there's a lot of love that goes into this and a lot of great people. So um, if you do end up watching it on your laptop, because that's the only way to see it right now, hopefully when it is released in HD on whether it's iTunes or DVD or Blu-ray, you also check it out there so you can really, really see just how, how great the show is. Um, but it, the good thing is it's a sitcom. It's about the characters and the situations and the jokes. And um, I've been blown away by the response to it and how, how passionate the fans of that show have been because it's unlike anything else I've done. Like, we don't just get fan mail that says, I love the show. This part is funny. I love this character. It's like 10 page things that are thank you letters, like telling their own stories about what they're struggling to try to accomplish or their heartbreaks or whatever it is. Um, it's really, it's, it's really great. And the cast, if you are on the Facebook page for it, you've seen like, we're very much in touch with the fans. We communicate directly with them all the time. And, um, it's, it's a, it's a very unique, great thing and I didn't know if it was going to work when I did it I'm like all right I'm, now I'm going to do this sitcom this was my dream project that's what I came out here to do and everybody might fucking hate it because they're going to be like really a sitcom like with a laugh track are you kidding me but they didn't and um it's it's quickly becoming one of the most popular things I've ever made so um so very very grateful for that and season two is undoubtedly my favorite thing I've I've ever ever done um if if you saw the Christmas special you can see the difference between season one and the Christmas special um, and where the show is going. And season two is just on a whole nother level. So it's not as emotionally heartbreaking and tear jerking as the Christmas special was. And a lot of people did not get through that without crying. Um, I'm not going to say that there won't be moments this season that might creep up on you, but uh, it's back to the crazy, gory, funny stuff. I mean, the first three minutes of season two are crazier and more violent than all of season one put together. So, <laughs> um, when's the season premiere? June fourth on on Fearnet, and two days later it'll be on Fearnet.com. If you don't get uh, the actual network and you can't watch it on TV, very cool. All right, hey Adam, man, let's just let's plug everything that's coming up again at the end of May. Uh, we got on May the the whole the whole three day thing starts on May twentieth, goes to May thirtieth. On the twenty eighth, it's the Halston Comes Home event where you guys are going to be screening. Three episodes of season two in Halston. Three episodes, including we're going to show the found footage episode from the season, which was shot in Halston, Mass. And we're going to show the um, animated episode because we have an animated episode this season, which is incredible. Um, and we're going to show an episode that guest stars Derek Mears and Bailey Madison, who people would know as a little girl in Don't Be Afraid of the Dark and Once Upon a Time, who is absolutely fucking hilarious. And it is... It is so, the storyline is so wrong that you'll probably be watching it with your mouth covered, being like, are you <laughs> kidding me? Um, every time we've shown that episode to people, they're just looking at me like, really? And I'm like, yes. Crazy. Then the 29th is the Boston Strong Silent Auction Party, hosted by Adam Green and Friends at the Palladium in Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, that's going to be a really good time. And then on the 30th, we have the Hatchet Movie Marathon, which is going to be the first ever 
is this the, is this the this is the first U.S. public screening of this, right? Yeah, it'll be the first time anywhere in the world that anybody publicly has gotten to see Hatchet Three. And is this the this is the theatrical cut, correct? This is the theatrical cut. It is it is my uh, final cut approved, locked, done. BJ's locked, done, approved. This is the version of the movie. Nothing is cut out. It's uh, the version that we want everybody to see. Excellent. So, and we are going to be there all all three days. We're going to be broadcasting on and off throughout the three days. Um, Adam will hopefully be joining us a couple times. We'll grab Joe too, and you guys can do some movie crypt scripts, um, you movie crypt stuff with our equipment to use later on, so you can get some stuff. Because I think you guys really should definitely have some stuff from the event for the shows later on. Because this is going to be a very special three day event, and it's going to be, um, it's just this is going to be a really really awesome thing that I think is going to be very memorable for a very long time for a lot of people. Yeah, and thank you for offering uh, to to let us record some stuff while we're back there because we're we're pre recording those episodes of the movie crypt for while we're gone. But obviously the next episode, once we're back, we're going to want to talk about this. So if we could record some stuff when we're there, that would, that would be great. Hey, you know, man, I'm here to help you out. You've been very good to us since uh, our inception and it's all, it's all payback. Awesome. Thank you. So Adam, thank you very much for your time, man. Uh, we'll be seeing you in a couple weeks. Yes. I'll see you guys soon. All right. Take care and uh, be safe, brother. All right. That was Adam Green. Uh, thank you guys very much for listening to this. If you would like to donate and can't make it out to the event, the best place to go is onefunboston.org is the uh, the um, site where you can go and donate to the uh, Boston One Fund. A lot of people are gonna need are gonna need this money later on, and uh, just because the event happened a few weeks ago, you know these are lifelong injuries people have to deal with. Uh, Want to thank Adam from. Uh, the bottom of our hearts for doing this. Uh, it's a very special event, and he's got some really, really awesome things going on with it, which is going to be great. So with that said, uh, thank you very much for joining us for this special uh, talk with Adam Green, and hope to see you guys out there. If you would like a pair of tickets, like to win a pair of tickets to the Hatchet Movie Marathon, all you have to do is send us an email at feedback at outsidethecinema.com, answer the question posed by Adam of how many times was the back blunt end of the axe used by Victor Crowley? in the unrated version of Hatchet 2. So we will put all the winners in name and a hat and draw one winner. All you got to do is be able to get to the screening in Boston on May 30th. So thank you guys very much for joining us. want to thank the people over at Rock and Shock and Wicked Bird Media for helping put this event together. And uh, look forward to talking to everybody. See everybody soon.